Welcome, cloud fans. Day one, day one here at Works Fest, a four day festival of the mind. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Four days of everything you love about cloud technology, Salesforce, AI, uh, customer centered design, John wearing ridiculous glasses. As you can tell, we have a bit of a a whole music festival vibe going on. We, you know, we're all, we've all been killed by Zoom presentations over the course of the uh, the last few years. So we decided to liven it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to go through the agenda for the entire four day festival event shortly, um, and we're going to be kicking it off today uh, with a banger. I see, I am hip, I'm cool. I know what the kids say about about music these days. A, a banger um, with my friend here, Mr. Bulldog. But but first, before we do that, just quickly <clears throat> take off the glasses for a second. Next next slide. Coming up, there you go. So yes, yeah, so just just acknowledgement of country, or very very important. Um, so CloudWorks, the whole group acknowledges and pays respect to uh, past, present, and future traditional custodians and elders of this nation, and the continuation of cultural, spiritual, and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And, and one thing that I am adding everywhere, um, important for us also as technologists to recognize the role of our traditional and in indigenous people in advancing technology that actually we had um, some incredible technologists surviving on the land and thriving on the land um, and learning how to, to do all sorts of things from biochemistry to uh, advanced fisheries. Um, it, it, there's really an enormous and rich tapestry and history of, of technology and scientific use as part of our heritage as well, which I'm very proud, very proud to, to be a part of. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll explain, I'll put these glasses back on. <laughs> um, so today, today I'm actually doing the interviewing, that's why I've got the ridiculous setup, with the one and only Chris Baldock. He's our CTO, co-founder, leader, all-round lovely guy, um, certified technical architect, and the one who actually has real glasses. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Yeah, no, no, glad to be here. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're going to be talking about some cool stuff today. Um, this, this talk track, what we're going to be getting into, Salesforce 3.0, we won't kind of do any spoilers, but the whole premise for doing this is... Me and JC and many of the people that we work with in the ecosystem have genuinely never or not been this excited about Salesforce since we started our career. And that's a that's a really big statement. And that's why we made this presentation. And hopefully we're going to be talking about some interesting stuff, hopefully showing some things that you didn't know is already here, already exists on the Salesforce platform. And, uh, and uh, a bit of irony is I'm going to be talking about data and AI, which I know a bit about, but I'm joined by JC who has been living that world for many, many, many years. So kind of- It's really cathartic for me. I, this yeah, is amazing. Exactly. I get to ask you the questions. <laughs> well, the, if we get a really smart question, I might have to deflect back to you, but I'm going to give it a go. Oh, I'm going to try not to make that happen. The real question, the first question is, um, is he going to make me take these glasses off? We were fighting backstage. That's why you were all delayed. I say no. I say I should keep them on the whole time. He's got oh, glasses. No, that, that's good. That's good. Good. They're even, they're, they're kind on. of on brand. They're kind of on brand. Okay, well, let's just quickly to the next slide. I'm All going right. to keep asking Chris to do that because, you know, he, he he's in charge. I don't actually get the, the clicker. Um, it's probably fair. I wouldn't trust me with the clicker either. But if you're just joining us, the thing to understand is that this is a, a four-day festival event. There's lots of different streams on lots of different days about a whole range of different things that you can dial in remotely. Um, so if you've got time in your calendar and you want to learn a little bit more about what's going on uh, in the world of cloud, Salesforce, data, AI, the whole lot, um, we're the coolest people to be hanging out with. So come hang out. The other thing too, is that if you're in Sydney in particular on Thursday, we're going to have some amazing events in person, right? In the incredible Salesforce tower. So register, 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 register. Um, we've already got a whole heap of people that are registered and listening and, and joining, um, but it's not too late. There's still spaces. So make sure you're clicking on the registration links, um, assuming that you haven't been scared away by my terrible fashion choices. Anyway, so let's, let's dive in. Let's get to it. Chris, Salesforce 3.0, like you said, you said some pretty heavy stuff. Yep. Um, you've been doing Salesforce for a decade. You know, I'm now unfortunately in the same space. I'm not supposed to say the word decade. That makes everybody really upset. Um, but it, uh, Salesforce 3, approaching it as like this this step change, mm. um, it is a bold claim. Substantiate it, sir. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a bold claim. Um, and these things don't happen just through the innovation of a single technology. You know, every year... From Dreamforce, it's pretty natural that there's going to be one, you know, big thing, uh, and typically there's going to be, you know, several things that happen behind the scenes to make that big thing happen. But it's really very, very rare that we get something this big. And obviously, everyone knows about ChatGPT. Um, you know, that was deployed, kind of made available to the public about two years ago. 
And my mind was blown. Uh, and clearly everyone else's mind was blown because that has uh, and maybe will be forever or for a very long time, the fastest growing application ever mm. because people were just so shocked at how smart that technology was and how it was so much better than what they thought was kind of currently available in the market, right? Just through kind of like Amazon, um, you know, and, and kind of the Google offering. Really so, inflection point. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it's, it's a huge inflection point. And, you know, that technology in itself, the generative AI, obviously lots of underlying technologies have come together to, to bring that capability to the level of quality that, that is today. But then there's also a number of supporting technology or groups of technologies that have also come together that Salesforce have hugely invested in that together provide something really quite revolutionary and like a genuine transformative leap forward for what this can mean for for day to day work, you know, for productivity, for creativity, even. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really what this presentation is about. It's about unpacking each of these kind of three core tenants here. So you've got your generative AI, you've got your modern data platforms, and you've got security governance. We're going to talk about how we believe Salesforce has all of this technology now, probably a lot more capability than you actually you know thought is is actually available. Um, and then what this means for you know for work. I think this is a really important point. Like we talk about things like freight train trends that the that you're not you're you're saying here from the start, like really zoom up. This isn't even about one thing. That this is about a convergence of of each thing themselves being quite a big thing, yeah. right? And, but when you bring it all together, we we know that when that happens in a market, um, when you have convergence, that that's when really big changes happen and and really exciting things happen. And I think I think you're right to kind of point out that like, hey. In addition to the GPT thing, um, when you put it on top of these other major changes we've seen in the platform, mm. um, it deserves it deserves a moment to stop. Okay. Oh, guess, guess oh hang on. Our, our slides are blurry. Mm. Okay. Oh, that's not good. If you can't read, I thought that was just us. Well, first of all, is it blurry to you? It, it could just be that individual's internet connection. No, I, I can actually see it's coming through blurry in the uh, in the shared screen i'm looking at so we so we both look non-blurry wow. correct i think so okay we're in tech we're in technology everybody we're in technology. Um, you know what no, no matter how fast and how far technology advances basic things like internet connections webinars you know those are always things holding us back but there's not much i can do i think let's just make the most of it hopefully it's not the case for everyone um we are recording this and so we'll absolutely be happy to share this recording afterwards and then hopefully that way you're going to you know be able to dive into any particular you know uh piece that you want to do. all right let's let's go let's go so salesforce pro big claim um salesforce um believe this is pretty big too and you might have seen the image on the left which is how they are consolidating talking about these different technologies and how they come together so they've got data plus ai plus crm plus trust that's the salesforce package the value uh we have a very similar logo so we've we've gone for something a little bit different it's got the key components but we've placed this differently to demonstrate a few things that aren't really coming across in the in the salesforce version which is the multiplier effects that each of these core technologies have on one another. You know, CRM is powering data. Obviously, there's a lots of rich data that you're getting from your CRM. And as Salesforce continues to release more and more capabilities, you're getting access to more and more data um, than ever before. Obviously, data powers CRM, right? If you're able to connect mm. to your broader ecosystem of data and make that available through your people, through the system of work, well, that's incredibly powerful. Um, everyone knows that data is a huge and important fundamental component of AI, right? Like the 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 ability um, and the potential for things like uh, generative and predictive AI, it's it's all based on data, right? And then, 100%. without a doubt, you know, through generative AI, people have seen that when done right, generative AI can seriously power uh, workflow. It can seriously power people in basically any single domain. It doesn't matter if you're in sales, service, marketing, finance. Um, people hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm a yeah, consultant. So I'm a consultant. I got to keep yeah. you honest here, right? Uh, so I got, I got to ask like, okay, Mr. Consultant Man, I see that you've taken like these four words from Salesforce and you've turned them into a much more stable trapezoid. Um, what, what's the significance of putting like trust in yes. this, this kind of circular space on the outside? Yes, what, why yes, why is yes. that? Well, well, trust is more important than it's ever been. Um, you know, Salesforce... From, from day one, their number one value was trust. And that was crucial because they were very 
early adopters of cloud. Uh, and they they created uh, maybe maybe it was the first ever kind of example of a mm. cloud CRM, a cloud platform. And trust was essential because they had to convince customers who are used to hosting their own data to then be willing to trust Salesforce to appropriately safeguard that data on their behalf, right? Mm. And so they've had this since day one. Um, I think they've lived up to that promise, in, you know, incredibly well, at least you know, as far as I'm aware from, from the 12 or so years I've been in this ecosystem. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And and now trust is even more important. So trust, you know, used to be just a few years ago, it was about ensuring that the users of your platform, anyone who has access to it, be internal or external, you could trust that those individuals are only going to be able to see and do what they're privileged to and nothing outside of that, right? Now you're throwing generative AI into the mix. And mm. through the likes of data cloud that we're gonna be talking about, you're extending that data, not just the data you have in your CRM, but the data that you have across your entire data ecosystem. So it, it's more crucial than ever that you have a very well governed, trusted security architecture that allows you know, businesses and individual users of this technology to trust that it's, it's gonna work in their favor. It's not gonna permit them to do anything that they shouldn't, you know, be able to do otherwise. I, th I think that's really important too. Like the, I've always talked about Salesforce as being kind of like the the Apple of IT. It's a it's a walled garden, and that's a good thing. Um, and yeah. at the moment, we, we're very much when you put those three things in the middle, what you're saying is customer data, all the rest of your data, and the generative AI thing. So like your three highest targets at the moment for cybersecurity, for potential compromise. And, and the fact that um, Salesforce has a, a framework where all of that can now be governed really very securely inside um, you know, the most trusted platform, I would argue, for, yep. for orchestrating and coordinating as a system yep. of engagement. Um, I, think, I think your diagram's spot on, is that it, it's like a perimeter. Yep. Um, that's, okay, the, so that, that's the perimeter. And obviously you've got the three components that are highly complementary and they multiply the effectiveness of each other. So, you know, from our perspective, it really is a case of one plus one plus one plus one. It, it doesn't equal four, it equals 15, 20, you know, whatever you want to call it. it it's, it's so much powerful when you have these components mm. uh, harmonized, uh, you know, contributing to each other. Love it, love it. All right, well, take us, take us on a journey. Dive let's us go. into this this thesis. There you go. So we've set the scene. Let's, we've set let's the scene. dive into it. All right. You might have seen this slide. Um, this slide is mostly a Salesforce slide. Uh, I, we've made some kind of small adaptations. But the reason we've used this, because uh, this is a great uh, kind of more of an architecture kind of view of the world and how these three different components fit together. So you've still got the, the same three layers. You've got CRM at the top. You've got AI, which is the kind of the Einstein one model layer in the middle, which is all that you know cognition and intelligence. And then below that, you've got data. Now here, we're using data to really focus specifically on data cloud. Um, and we're gonna dive more into that and kind of what that unpacks. But you know, at, at a high level, you've got the CRM, you've got your AI, and you've got your data. Um, now we're gonna go through these layers, you know, one at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're gonna start with CRM, move into AI, move into data, you know, um, mm -hmm. so it's kind of easy to follow. Before I do that, John, any, any questions, anything? Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing I was going to comment on is that um, you know, I love three-layered architectures, um, but I, I think what's impressive is, you know, CRM, uh, Salesforce, it's kind of just that top layer. Yes. <laughs> what, what a lot of people have thought of as, you know, that, that's where that, we play. That is it's, traditionally Salesforce. That, that's, you that's might see layer. some Yourself <laughs> and some kind of connectivity, but that what we're used to is not even it's that the top, top bit. two levels. It's that yeah. very, very top bit. It's that apps and workflow. Yeah. A hundred percent. And we've in a very short space of time, what we've seen now is the very legitimate claim to say that you, you've now got um, a significant part of the enterprise architecture unpacking underneath it um, and that that's going to kind of power it. So what I love about this is like you, you've really got that idea of the system of engagement, uh, this emerging idea of like system of cognition and the system yeah. of knowledge. Um, and that Salesforce is saying, look, we, we are definitely the top thing. Um, yes. We don't have to be everything in the in the bottom things, but we're, we're going to plug into them. Um, oh, yeah, and, and that, that was one of the things that... So I was excited before, but when I found out that Salesforce were doing this in such a way to also be an open ecosystem and then mm. allow customers to choose their own model to be able to to um, you know choose their own LLM you know uh, you know large language generative model to be able to choose their own predictive AI model and that through data cloud we'll talk about this later 
that they're also uh, jumping on a very cool technology and one of the earliest adopters to allow zero copy data sharing. Oh, um, yes. Which means that you can, like, if you have your own data lake, data warehouse, you've invested in that, you've already made it so that you have your enterprise data shared in that, that's great. You're teasing me. We're jumping ahead. Yeah, we, we are. You know, I want to. You know, I want to talk about that so much. But but again, it's yeah. Bring your own lake. It's like it's cool. You got a lake. You've invested in it. Lakes are very powerful. You don't need to just replicate all of that data. If you have one of those, hook the bar, and you get access to all of that data in both directions. And I I thought that was incredible. That's because it is. Yeah, that, that's because we're, we're that's because we're sleeping on it, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. But we'll we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Now, just in case you know, I know people have been saying they're having difficulty potentially seeing the slides if they've got internet jam. Um, what are we diving into first, sir? Maybe just Three. read it All out. All right, diving into first, we are going into the first layer: AI enhanced productivity. Now, you might mm. stop me and say, "But Chris, haven't we already had AI on Salesforce for multiple years?" And and uh, JC, I know you specifically. You you've been doing a lot of this work. For several years, right? You're one of the really several. That's a it. that's a that's a political statement. Several. That's better than decade. Yeah. Yeah. That's for, no, absolutely. You're, you're, absolutely. You've been in this space um, for a long time, but historically, the big focus here is in predictive AI, and mm. they had a number of um, you know predictive AI capabilities, which are kind of more turnkey, like your kind of recommendation builder and those sorts of things. Switch it on. Uh, uh, lead scoring, opportunity scoring, that kind of stuff, right? And then they had some more powerful stuff under, you know, under the hood. Einstein discovery. Einstein discovery. Right? Shout out to my boy Bobby Brill, the amazing exactly, Bobby Brill. Right? It built shipping that product year after year. Now yeah, on data cloud. Now on data cloud. Now on data cloud. And, and so they, you know, very early on, they they invested in this technology and they gave us a suite of different technologies to go kind of as deep as you wanted to go, really, right? Um, in terms of either using what they give you or, or creating your own prediction models to do things like customer churn or uh, propensity to buy or, you know, all that kind of like the, the standard stuff, right? The mm -hmm. big difference and the stuff that we're going to be focusing on uh, as part of this presentation is the new stuff, which is predominantly focused on generative AI and focusing on a few things. One, just how much great capabilities are available now. Like we're not talking about roadmap here. Mm. We're literally just going to be talking about what's the stuff that you can buy now and I really want to highlight this because I think most customers don't actually understand how much good stuff is there, right? And totally. so we should, you know, be able and, to. And in their that. in their defense, you know, it it has grown yeah, yeah. at an unprecedented rate. Like I have never seen this level never. of drop. And again, kudos to to Salesforce and, and San Fran and the product teams worldwide. Just the sheer volume of stuff that's been shipped in a short space of time, really, really impressive. But yeah, it does mean there's definitely a delta between what the market's aware it can do and what yeah. is literally available right now. And that's why we're doing this talk, right? I was going to say. That gap. How convenient. We've put this together for you. All right. So there you go. Okay, cool. Yourself. All right. So we're going we're gonna to dive into it. Before I do, you know, what you've got here is just a few kind of examples, right? But, but Salesforce's approach here is about bringing generative AI to all clouds within Salesforce, all users. So, you know, we're going to give examples of heaps of functionality that are going to be applying to uh, sales, service, marketing, commerce, experience, analytics. There's just so much good stuff here. And so some of the ones I've highlighted here, at the very beginning, you've got Einstein Copilot. That's probably the most powerful capability. We'll talk about that later, but that's essentially your chat GPT on steroids in Salesforce. Right, and I'll talk about why on steroids. Why is that? Why am I saying that's better than ChatGPT? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll explain that comment. I won't just kind of lay it and not touch it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got kind of uh, capabilities such as generative e email. You know, for, for 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 different domains for you know sales and service, for example. You've got conversation summary. So if you want to just very quickly catch up uh, on on a conversation or a series of conversations to understand where that particular you know, case or opportunity, customer, et cetera, is, is at. You can do that very simply. Reply recommendations, you know, the ability to live suggest reply recommendations to service agents who are having live chat sessions uh, to be able to, you know, speed up uh, the ability in which they can respond uh, or answer maybe say difficult questions from customers. You've got knowledge creation, which is very cool. Uh, knowledge base is very, very valuable, but often quite hard to govern and keep up to date. Um, so here's a technology that allows you to, at the press of a button, uh, generate a draft knowledge article based 
purely on the interactions you've had in the history of a particular case. Now, that, that's hugely powerful in terms of making sure that your knowledge base is kept up to date. And then you've got things like engagement content. So Marketing Cloud, a big part of that focus is all about uh, generating uh, multimodal content, be that kind of, you know, uh, campaign taglines or even kind of images to support your campaigns and making it as easy as possible to, to generate that to get a campaign uh, up and running or just to say boost engagement of, of um, you know, a particular marketing journey they're working on. And this is this is just a tiny, tiny, tiny example of the sorts of things. In fact, how tiny is this? Well, uh, this slide. Now we're gonna is... we're gonna try something quickly, Chris, because because yeah. if, if we have got a few people still talking about the the video, I'm gonna press a button. It might break everything. Here we go. We're gonna switch oh. to trying to share okay. content. Okay. Did that just change? Has Did anybody? You... No, not for you. Well, not nothing changed on my end. Okay. Oh, is there any way we can rotate? Has anyone got uh, D? I don't know if you're able to rotate what's being shared as the main slide. Because apparently if you change focus, if people are on the other end, if you change focus, if you've got any option, what you're focusing on, you focus on the slide, some of that blurriness uh, can go away. Okay. Okay, cool. No, that's fine. We'll keep going. Dive into okay, it, Chris. Let's keep going. Okay, okay. So um, this slide is to demonstrate a subset a genuine subset of all of the amazing generative AI capabilities are available now. I very intentionally not talked about roadmap, you know, for, for a few reasons. One, it's a roadmap, you know, safe harbor. We, you can't necessarily commit to anything that's on it, but also I don't think I even need to because there's so much good stuff available now. Uh, we could do an entire presentation just talking about this, right? Um, and, and again, this is what I think most people don't really understand is just how much available content there is now with mm. generative AI. And, and also what's incredible is most of this has been made available in the last six months. And if you were to see a roadmap, you would see this multiplied. And, and that just demonstrates the amount of focus and investment that Salesforce is doing uh, to ensure that they really are, do remain the number one CRM and that they are uh, you know, giving very strong generative AI capabilities to all users of Salesforce. What, what I uh, just comment I'll make on this one, right? Like, so um, at the moment, one of the, the positions we have is um, you need to be careful in how you invest in, in generative AI because uh, people picking winners right now are really struggling. Um, and, and this is kind of an example of why the really big players of which Salesforce is one, um, they can ship integrations like this that leverage things like open AI, uh, a little group, like two or three of these is an entire app that's yeah. probably, you know, been funded, tried to get out there and is now already dead um, out of Silicon Valley. So that when you step back and see what's going to happen, it, it makes a lot of sense for you to be actually staying focused on platforms that you're either strategically invested in already, um, or which you're, if you're considering where you're going to go, going with a platform makes more sense because um, I know one commentator calls it the, the the sport of kings at the moment. Like we're spending billions on retraining these models constantly. Um, it, it makes more sense to for you to be working with a layer like Salesforce because they can do this. They they can ship you know, a monumental number of upgrades, every one of which could then be something you're leveraging to either improve the the apps that you've already built or to potentially catalyze a new value proposition for you, for you to realize with your investment. Mm. Um, it, from a capability perspective, that is just a massive uplift. And again, I'm looking at that and going, that's effectively the generation one release page. Yep. <laughs> like we're probably going to have two or three more of those before the yep. journey's over. Just going to get better. And, and Salesforce, to their credit, and we'll talk about this later, we've got a slide for this, have actually made it incredibly easy to get started with a lot of these capabilities. So we'll talk to that a bit later in terms of like, how, how do you actually get going? Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. So uh, we talked a little bit about the AI enhanced productivity. The next bit I want to go to into is Einstein One Studio. Now Einstein One Studio, which is the you know terminology that Salesforce was using, is really the tools and key capabilities that, you know, the platform capabilities that Salesforce are giving you um, to, either support a lot of these generative AI capabilities or support say Copilot, um, or in the, you know, um, in the example of say Copilot builder, prompt builder, model builder, it's the tools that you can use to actually configure um, the these technologies and have an ability to control, um, you know, when a, when a particular, you know, end user or customer asks for something to give you more controls in exactly 
how is that information pulled together and mm -hmm. what kind of format are you responding to? And I think that's really key. Uh, and that's one of the crucial differences between, say, if you're a chat GPT user versus if you're going to be a co-pilot user, it's just going to, it just gives you so much more control and configuration based control in terms of the actual responses that are pulled together, generated, and then shared with your, you know, end users as well. I love your next slide. All right, go, to your go. Next, go to your next go. slide. I actually it, I adapted this since the last. So maybe there's something new here because it's a bit different from when we uh, did our little rehearsal. Okay. Einstein wants you. This is completely off the cuff, Chris. This is we're grouping here, man. This is impromptu. I, I love it. That's what that's what we're about, man. All right. So uh, why is Einstein one crucial? I, I'm not going to be talking about all of Einstein one. I'm going to be focusing more specifically on Copilot and the technologies underlying Copilot that you can essentially work with to modify those outputs. And those key technologies is you've got your, um, you know, you've, you've got your RAG grounded search capabilities. We're going to talk about that. You've got your RAG. Right. Yes. Oh, you said it though. So you've said it now. So now you have to explain it. I will. So, I'm gonna. I'm gonna come back to. It. I'm gonna come Dr. Back to it. Dr. Chris Baldock. What does RAG stand for? I'll get back to it. And then you got your oh. co-pilot uh, builder, and then you got your your prompt library as well. Your kind of prompt builder. Okay. What is RAG? RAG retrieval augmented generation. This is a dun, key dun, dun. technology. Uh, I, I forget whether I've got a specific slide that goes into this. But I'm just going to talk about it now. So what this means and why this is so important uh, is the the uh the 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 contents that is then used to to ultimately generate your response you're not just relying on the llm you're not just relying on open ai and the the data set that they've used which is generic and it's not going to be specific or contextual to you as an individual or you as you know as an organization it means that you are grounding you're anchoring your responses in actual real data and Salesforce has this, and it's a core part of this underlying technology framework that Einstein One Studio they provided. And why this is so crucial is it means that when you're generating a response, you know, in response to a user prompt, it's the what it gives you in return. It's grounded in the data that you have in the CRM, so it's grounded in that current record. It's that related records, and it even goes further than that because it actually gives you a series of tools, what they call in kind of an action library where you can further configure exactly how you're going to get that data. You know, that could be a, uh, it could be a flow that you configure, right? Maybe you need to reach in and, and grab data from different components and transform it before you pull it back. It can be apex, you know, what if it's something quite complex, you need to run business logic, you know, it's not something that this is easily in flow. Uh, it can be an API. So if you've got a MuleSoft API, it's going to be able to also uh, actually invoke that API to go and retrieve that data. Uh, and that, that's exactly why. So that, what, what Chris just said, you know, if you would have heard me at Vivade, you know, last week saying the same thing. Um, I think I am saying on record, I think the whole world is going to wake up and realize that Salesforce, while nobody was looking, has built the number one governed enterprise grade solution for generative AI uh, workflow tooling. And, in, and the reason why I think I can say that is they have a thing called Flow. And it, it is already a top tier industry beating, you know, trusted, recognized tool for no code or low code, you know, uh, workflow automation. And with this tooling that Chris has got on, on screen, they've just plugged the entire generative AI landscape into that thing. And when you're when you're playing with tooling in Gen AI right now, you're you're typically doing a lot of hard API to API, right? Salesforce has has normalized the idea that yes, you can do that, sure. But for everything else, there's you know there's Mastercard, there's there's Flow. And, and mm -hmm. so by by taking that and socketing that straight in to the API first approach that these Gen AI solutions have, what they've really done is I think stolen a march to market because yeah. If, you, if you've got people in your organization that are comfortable with flow, guess what? You've actually already got a significant capability to roll out Gen AI. Um, so th this, I think, is just, it's, it's hard. And until you've seen the other way people are doing Gen AI, which looks a lot almost like microservices, dare I say yeah. it, like it's lots of parallel custom-built script kitty APIs, um, it, you don't quite appreciate what a chalk and cheese it is. And yet... Developing on this, I can say because we've been doing it right. We've we've been in like rag pilots um, uh, using their new databases. It, it is absolutely 
you know, a, an enterprise ready solution. Um, it's responsive, it's, it's effective. And, and it, like you said, it has all the benefit of the trust layer. Yep. Yeah. No, it's so, so powerful. Um, and the reason I've drawn this diagram is to help, help explain kind of, well, how does this actually work? Like what are the flows and steps that take place um, in order to basically deliver this capability and kind of why this is, this is supercharged to kind of what I would get with kind of like traditional GPT, right? Mm -hmm. So the way you're supposed to read this diagram is really kind of top down. So at the top layer, you're engaging with uh, Copilot uh, and you're engaging it with, in it with it in the same way that you would do with GPT, right? You're asking it a question or you're asking it to do something for you. So this could be from a sales user postponer, you know, help me catch up on activity. Oh, <laughs> oh no, it's server, sorry. Help, help me catch up on activity for this case. For sales, it could be, you know, a generator, an email for this particular customer. Uh, for uh, commerce, it could be help suggest a promotion or, or discount, right? There's there's so many different use cases. Now that hits Copilot, you know, that's the window um, through which you're interacting with this generative AI. And then there's a, a series of things that happens behind the scenes. The first thing that happens is Einstein creates a plan. Uh, and I, I could I could have an entire presentation on this bit because I think this is so mm. cool. But mm. the way it does this is based on the various actions that you have made available. And there's, there's, there's something called like an action library. So you've got a whole bunch of out of the box actions. Uh, and these are things like being able to query a record, update a record, draft an email, you know, those sorts of things. And then you also have the ability to create custom actions. Now, custom action could be a semantic search, you know, basically, uh, you know, looking through the data that you have available in Salesforce or your periphery, um, mm -hmm. not purely based on key data points, but actually semantics, right? Meaning, and we'll get into that later. Um, but then also- My favorite word. Yeah, and then we'll also, but, but then you've also got a prompt library, and a prompt library is your library of pre-crafted and you know tested, validated prompts um, that you know work really well for kind of like your core use cases. So it can dip into that, it can dip into Flow, it can dip into Apex, it can call an API, and that's just what we have available now. That's that's going to extend. Now the really cool thing, how it creates that plan, is based on how you describe those different actions. So it will, again, semantics, it will pick up on what you're asking and what you're ultimately trying to get from it. It will create a plan intelligently uh, and it will pick itself from the actions it needs is to go and invoke that plan. And that's that's crazy. So you're not, you're not having to build, oh, you know, if someone wants to draft an email, you have to do this, 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 this. No, it's way smarter than that. Mm -hmm. You give it the tools and the generative AI is smart enough to pick the right tools for the job. And I think this I, is I this that. that was crazy. Like, I was like, it, it, uh, and I think you know, I could I, like you, I could probably talk for a long time about um, things like agentic AI. Uh, if people are looking for things to Google afterwards, agentic AI is a, a big part of that. But I, I I think this slide for me, and we, we'll keep going because I know you know we, we've yeah. got a few more to get through. But if you if there's going to be a slide, actually, it's probably the next slide. If you go to the next slide, because I think you right add time. you add you add a little bit more on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going I'm to quickly wrap up this one, which is after, after it actually creates the plan, it goes and executes the plan, and then crucial step, it grounds your output in your real live data, and that's key, right? So it's going to as part of the LLM, it's going to know things, but it's going to prioritize the knowledge that it has in your CRM. And that, that's a really crucial part. And then finally, it brings all of this together and it generates your response or performs the action because it's not just about giving you text. The really cool thing, it can go and do stuff. It can go and update records. It can send an email with an additional prompt. And, and, and that's where I think we're going to see that next wave of innovation is it's going to be moving on from generating and moving towards actually trusting that generative AI to go and act, you know, perform that next kind of, you know, step action. I will, I will add one, because that's my job. I will add one yeah. little geek moment here, folks, again, for people who are wanting to, to Google after the show. Um, the, the thing about the grounding, the thing about the retrieval augmented generation, so like it, it makes some intuitive sense. Um, if I can give you just a little bit of insight into it, it's a bit more than that. Um, the thing that makes a, a LLM operate primarily has been this breakthrough in, in what's called self-attention. Um, that when you when you type something in, there's a thing called the context window, and the context window gets thought of as like its short term memory. What it really is is it's kind of like the input hopper. Um, and, and in theory, if you don't use all of it, effectively you can think of the remainder as basically being blank. Mm -hmm. Whatever goes into that hopper 
the the calculations, vast calculations that go on um, as you're powering the LLM, they pay literally attention to that. So the if you're not using that space to pack in as much additional and specific contextual information as you can, you're not leveraging anything yep. like what it's capable of, right? So in addition to the intuitive understanding of the more context I give you, the more specific the response will be. It's actually even deeper than that, right? Mathematically, from the perspective of how to get the best out of these tools, you actually, there's a balancing act. You don't want to necessarily at this stage just give them enormous amounts of context for the hell of it. But the more you can pad into that initial input function, the more you're actually literally changing the, the weights and the attention yeah. of the entire model's execution. Um, and it's why having that built in from day one with the Salesforce architecture, um, I think is, is market beating. Nice, 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 nice. Okay, I'm going to move on. We've got, what, we're 20 minutes left. We want to make sure we have at least five minutes of Q&A. So I'm probably going to speed up at this point. Yep, you, you're doing okay, one, but let's go. Yeah, let's go. Einstein One Studio is crucial. You know what? It's even better with Data Cloud. And the reason is, is because a huge component here, that grounding, it's based on your data. And so when you can give it that richer data pool, the results you're going to get back is going to be even more accurate, even more relevant. And through data cloud and uh, you know uh, seamless integration that you have with Salesforce, it and the fact it has a vector database, which is also crazy. I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly. Vector database, you might have heard that term. What that means is it's all about storing data, not just the data itself, but also storing it semantically. So based on uh, a, a number of attributes which uh, describe the underlying meaning of that data. So you would have seen this in, for example, Google search, mm -hmm. uh, specifically Google photos. You can type in wedding or you can type in sunset and it, within a heartbeat, it will go and bring back uh, very relevant content, right? Underlying that there's a vector database. It can do that because it takes an image, it runs an algorithm to extract out key tags or kind of meaning uh, or the, the different levels of meaning, different tags that could be associated with that particular image. And then it stores it in a way that it can be very easily retrieved based on that meaning. Data Cloud has a vector database. Now this is cool in, in a bunch of ways. It's very cool because it supports things like semantic search. It means that you know based on the prompt or, or based on what you're looking for, it doesn't just take the text and do a find me this where, you know, uh, where this field equals X, it's way smarter than that. Vector databases are also hyper, hyper efficient as well. It means that mm -hmm. not only can you extract out meaning, but you can do it incredibly fast. So data has a vector database, that's incredible. It also has the ability to store both structured and unstructured data. And that unstructured is so key because no longer are you relying on just storing records, right? Like your know, rows in the table, you can store PDFs, you can store videos, audio, and it's gonna be able to extract out and search content from those different formats. And so where my mind and instantly got to when I heard about it, this is like, whoa, 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 whoa. So we, I've worked with loads of contact centers and something which is very common is contact centers have huge libraries of PDFs, which essentially describe both the organizational knowledge, but also the service procedures. Like what are the things you need to do in order to, um, uh, to, to meet a particular query? And on, of, often it's fairly complex. You might have to go through different systems. Now, historically, if you wanted to make that useful in Salesforce, you had to basically convert all of that into knowledge articles, mm. uh, you know, which, which is okay. You know, it, you can do it and, and then it will, you know, uh, su support your, support your uh, service agents. But, what if you could, what if you didn't need to do that? What if you could just take that entire uh, library of knowledge that you have available on documents and you could just put that into Data Cloud? And what if that was instantly available for your co pilot, for your generative AI? That's crazy. Data Cloud actually has that. And so this is why that if you have Data Cloud in the mix, uh, I haven't even talked about how you can, you know, we can, we talked about this a little bit earlier, how you can connect it with your uh, other lakes, you know, for zero copy data sharing, mm -hmm. uh, it makes that generative AI capabilities so, so, so much more powerful. No, 100%. And uh, I mean, in the interest of time, I, I, I wanted to, to keep cruising through. But yeah, th yeah. Th th there's, like we said, there's a whole slide there that um, people, th there's been so much change. I think people uh, lose the, the, the whole picture. But 
this idea that data cloud is actually a connective layer. It's a substrate layer. Um, it's bring your own everything. You can bring your own data lake, bring your own database, bring your own model, bring your own AI, bring your own documents, right? As as people begin to grok that, that, that's when I think people are going to be like, oh, that's literally what I've always wanted Salesforce to do. And, and now it's kind of yeah. like the restrictions are gone. You, you're going to have significant... That's why you know Chris and I are constantly challenging ourselves to be like almost everything where you have an assumed pattern for how you solve this in Salesforce. Yeah, in the game has changed. You have, you have, you, yeah, you yeah, have to yeah, you have to stop. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, or could I just do that with like three calls to an LLM yes. and a vector database? If the answer is yes, we should just do that. Yep, it's going to be faster and cheaper. Yep. All right. All right. That. Um, Einstein trust layer. I'm going to jump into this really quickly. It's very important, uh, I'm, but I'm going to have to go fast because we have a lot, a lot of content to still get through. Uh, we talked about trust, how trust is so important to Salesforce. Salesforce in the background have been innovating and building out additional capabilities in trust specifically to support the gender AI. Um, the key ones that they talk to, uh, and this is not this is not all of them. This is just kind of like some of the headlines are the ones that I've mentioned here, which is secure data retrieval, dynamic grounding, data masking, toxicity detection, and zero data retention. Now, this is a bit of a workflow. Um, so you're kind of calling this in sequence based on how you're interacting with an AI agent. And the way that, I think I've got this. No, you know what? It's I haven't actually ordered this in necessarily the same order. But basically, the way to think about this is at the very beginning, you have a user prompt. You have a user who's engaging with the generative AI. It goes through these sequence of steps and stages, not necessarily in this order, before actually generating its output. And I'm just going to talk very quickly to watch each of these. Very apps. quickly. Very quickly. So secure data retention, super important. What this means is that if you're asking the bot to do something, it can only do a thing or retrieve a data based on your privileges or its privileges. It can't go outside that realm, which means it's never going to access and expose data that you, you shouldn't be able to see. Dynamic grounding, that's essential. It's not just going to trust and rely on data that was used to train the underlying LLM, like you know, uh, like a GPT. It's it's going to be grounding that data and prioritizing your data to make sure that when you are giving that response, it's going to be it's going to be relevant and it's going to be accurate and it's going to be reliable. Data masking hugely important. Um, organizations have a huge wealth of personal and sensitive information. Now there are, are tools that Salesforce have now given you where you can actually classify, uh, you know, what is sensitive information for your particular organization within your particular industry. Um, they also metadata management, that, right? Yeah. But in addition to that, they've got their own AI, which helps them to also dynamically identify what is that personal sensitive information and uh, make sure that that's that's not shared, you know, based on you know uh, the particular context in which it's being interacted with. Toxicity. Uh, detection, hugely important. Um, it, it, it basically a layer that ensures that uh, before uh, the content that it uses is filtered to ensure that it's it's not toxic, right? It's it's not something that might uh, have a particular, you know, uh, inherent bias. It's not something that has profanity. It's not something It that... would ban these glasses. For example, <laughs> yeah, it exactly, wouldn't it wouldn't right? generate this. It has yeah. some level of filtering to make sure that that what it's replying to, um, whatever you know, data you've given it, it, it it's it's you know, it, it's gonna it it's it's not something that you wouldn't want to be shared essentially. And then finally, zero data retention. So Salesforce, um, they're not the LLM, they're the gateway to the LLM. Uh, and the really cool thing is they're actually allowed you to be open, but you know, you can choose, uh, you know, I mean, you know, with um, with, with big backers of OpenAI, uh, I think what they're mm -hmm. doing is absolutely incredible, but you're not limited to that. Now, what they have done is a crucial component of any partner, any LLM that they give you access to, they have a policy and agreement in place, which is that LLM will never store your data um, that's been used as part of that kind of user prompt before, um, uh, you know, after that's generated. So they will use, they will obviously use what it, what's given uh, in mm -hmm. the context to actually generate the output, but they will not persist that data. They will not retain it afterwards. And that's all right. All right, Doctor Boldock, I'm 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 routing you now. Go yep. to slide seventeen. All right. Oh, we're gonna miss it. Oh no. No, no. you're gonna go to slide seventeen. No, we're gonna yes. be digging up. I'm gonna no, miss it. Wait. You literally don't have time. You're going to slide no. seventeen. It's okay. We talked about data cloud before. That's fine. It's fine. All I'll right. I'll, I'll right. shed a little tear. I'll shed a little tear. You're gonna go to slide seventeen. We'll do and... another. We'll do another session of data cloud. Go okay. to go to slide seventeen. Go, you shall. Yes, means for my business. What this does. Okay. All right. 
So, so this, um, th these are the slides where uh, actually you're now going to have to kind of summarize because they're coming through a bit blurry, right? Okay, we'll um, summarize. Yeah, you're, you're going to need to summarize these. these. These are the ones that we'll have available you know, in a higher resolution later. But these, this is actually Chris's magnum opus at the moment, these, these three slides. Um, so we will get the high resolution through. We don't know what's going on with the, the, the blurrier slides coming through, guys. Um, but yeah, Chris, just take us through for the next right. five minutes. The, the key themes that you see, right? Um, cool. Yep. As yep, yep, you go through let, these iterations. Let, let, let's do this. Okay, so um, me as an individual, I'm a technologist, but I, I've, always, I've always kind of prided myself as someone who puts equal importance into people and process, people, process, technology. You know, I might have seen that kind of little, little triangle. Uh, and as part of my own kind of, you know, consultant journey over time, I've just increasingly pivoted to the importance of people and process, right? And so I try to make sure that my approach is kind of equally weighted across the three. What we've got here, we're just going to talk through a few slides, which kind of help you to understand, well, what does this actually mean in a process that you might, you know, commonly understand? And so this is, we've applied this and these innovations to what this would mean for a typical kind of case resolution pathway. This is your traditional pathway. I'm going to go through it really quickly, but uh, you know, nothing, nothing shown here is is particularly surprising, right? This is just the key steps you go through to resolve a case. You've got multiple channels in which you can, you know, capture a case. It's captured in Salesforce CRM. It's assigned to an individual to work on based on certain criteria. And Salesforce has got a few technologies that allow you to do this. Ultimately, it gets to someone. They need to manage that case, which often includes some kind of you know back and forth interaction with a customer. Uh, ideally, they're using Salesforce knowledge or some other kind of knowledge base to support them um, uh, with the effort of essentially resolving that case. Now, sometimes, for whatever reason, uh, maybe it's particularly complex. Maybe uh, that particular call center is a bit overloaded and that person wasn't able to get to that case in time. It might be escalated and assigned to someone else. Either way, it gets to a person, ultimately it's resolved, you might optionally have a feedback loop. Feedback loop, incredibly important to reach out to the customer, get some feedback on, on um, you know, um, the, the level of care um, that they've received as part of that case resolution. And then finally, all of that data stored in Salesforce, you're going to be able to uh, run reports and dashboards to get that kind of top, top line view of how we're doing. You know, how can we improve? This is what most people are doing today. The, the vast majority. Now, exactly how they do it, there might be some tweaks but it's all basically going to fall down into these kind of different steps. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of challenges. I'm not going to go into those. I don't think we have time, um, but the, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into them. That's another presentation. Okay. This is what people have access to now through the Salesforce Einstein one platform. Um, and this is just an example of kind of what this could look like. Now, the key theme here is the process is largely the same. But instead of it being purely reliant on the individual, their skills, their experience, their capacity, the big difference is every single step in this chain is now AI assisted. So the whole way through, you're going to have capabilities, in some cases, multiple capabilities that are going to be supercharging, supporting you to be able to do that particular stage so much more effectively than you might have otherwise been able to do so. Yeah, for the, for so, the people playing at home, yeah. the, the little purple ovals each yes. of those is a is a currently available gen ai feature basically aligned over the top and, and changing the nature of of that previous step correct um, Ex exactly right and so i might just kind of draw in a few of them um so you know uh obviously people you know for a few years you've got einstein live chat you've got chatbots um there are versions of this which are either out or literally about to come out where this is the next level, which is essentially exposing generative AI out to your customers to support them. So it's going to be a lot more intelligent. Um, either way, you, you still largely have the same channels. Some of them might be a little bit more assisted than they were previously. And it still results in you having a case in Salesforce, which is basically a container for doing the work required to, to resolve that particular interaction, question, complaint, et cetera. Um, now, Einstein case classification, this has actually been around for a while. Um, so what this is using is predictive AI. Uh, it's not generative AI, but I included it here because I think it's still very valuable. Based on attributes of that case that you configure, it will be able to uh, classify that case. Uh, so be able to you know, predict you know, uh, what is the priority of this case? What is the type and subtype of this case? You know, other attributes that are essential to ensure that that particular case 
gets to the right individual. So that's that's a really kind of crucial first part. They've also got unsigned case routing uh, that leverages omnichannel to make sure that it's going to the right person based on their skill set and capacity. So that gets the right person. Now, once it actually gets that person, they now have a heap of capabilities they didn't have before, which is going to really support them in managing that case. You know, they've got things like service replies, you know, uh, and there's kind of a few different, well, service replies and reply recommendations, which essentially do very similar things. It, it will generate suggested responses um, for, um, uh, for essentially replying or kind of progressing that particular case. And this is supported through, uh, uh, you know, different channels. So this is supported through just your typical kind of like email cases, supported through messaging, it's supported through live chats. Either way, it's it's helping suggest and helping you to kind of move that forward, right? Uh, it's got conversation summaries. Sometimes you might pick something up, something particularly complex, allows you to get up to it, up to speed really quickly. It's got generative knowledge creation. You know, if you if you manage to identify something that isn't in your knowledge base, you can very quickly draft that. And the, the, the real superpower is that co-pilot. So yes, very powerful to have buttons or things that just happening for you. But then you also have essentially this really smart assistant that knows everything about your process and your organization. And you can ask it questions and you can kind of go back and forth. And it can be that assistant to help you bridge the gap in, in your knowledge to help essentially, you know, resolve that particular case faster. And that, that, that's huge. You still, okay, Chris. Chris, we got yeah. five minutes. We got five minutes until until we're at time. Oh, so, my uh, yes. And so, okay. what I'm gonna what I'm gonna get you to do? Go to your to your All next right. slide. Here we go. Because Keeping, the, assisted the whole way through. Way indeed. Yep. Where's this going? And and I would actually argue that this is available. People are doing this now. Uh, we have a blueprint, and we think that we can also do this now on the Salesforce platform. The general theme here is where you're going to move to is from AI assisted, it's going to become key components of it autonomous. And so organizations are going to find that there are perhaps some types of cases, some type of interactions where you feel very comfortable uh, having that entire interaction being done with an autonomous AI agent. This is very powerful. Uh, particularly in, say, a call center, this is why this example where you've got uh, often, you know, very large components of your employees who are, uh, you know, are, are part time. Uh, you know, uh, you have to manage things like sick leave. You know, some pe sometimes people are sick in the same day, which really hits your capacity. What if you had a lever that you could direct more of that traffic on those days to an autonomous AI agent? That would be very powerful. Salesforce, I think, basically, we think have the tools and capabilities and there's a, there's a crucial one coming out in June, that means we can basically do this now. And that's very powerful. You're going to see a massive shift in channel containment effectiveness. No, no two ways about it, right? You're, you're, even if we're not talking about complete, you know, replacement of, of the need yeah. for, for humans, which we're certainly not, you know, saying that that's, that's the immediate impact. Um, but channel containment is just going to be accelerated dramatically Huge. by this. Right, so we, we've got, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, it's a, the, the slides are gorgeous. So when, when we get the high res slides back yeah. out there for everybody, take a, take a moment to pause and, and just consume some of the, the richer right. content. Let, um, let's, um, let's yeah, to the rescue. How can we get started? I'm going to be so quick. Salesforce have made this really easy. There's different ways that you can actually get involved and uh, that you can start using data cloud and Einstein. Probably, possibly the easiest way is through their new Einstein for sales and Einstein for service licenses. This gives you all of the core capabilities of sales and service, plus the traditional predictive AI capabilities, plus the new generative AI capabilities, plus it gives you a it gives you co-pilot, it gives you all of that kind of Einstein platform capabilities, and it gives you preloaded capacity for Einstein AI requests, data cloud storage, and data cloud credits. So if you have sales and service, uh, probably the easiest way to get started on this is going to be through purchasing one or more of these licenses. Um, we are your guide. We are investing huge into this particular area. We think we have a very unique proposition because through Lightfold um, and you know John and his team, you know we've been doing data and AI for years, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's Pick, that, particularly that's in the Salesforce. Statement. Particularly in the Salesforce ecosystem, right? Like it's, absolutely. Uh, so you know yeah. what that means for kind of establishing data cloud, for understanding your data state, for replicating that data, being able to use that data for predictive and generative AI. 
you ideally really do want a partner who is not learning this on the fly and has been doing it for years. And that's absolutely the case for us. We have multiple different streams um, for how we can support an organization. We have dedicated AI advisory, um, which has a number of things we've listed up there. We uh, And we have a blueprint of essentially how do we get any organization from starting that journey all the way to having some component of autonomous AI. Um, now, this is the kind of the public friendly version. There's no kind of secret source uh, within this. Behind the scenes, we have much more detailed blueprints and a lot more kind of thought leadership in what you might exactly want to be doing at each stage in this journey, going from starting all the way to being an innovator within your particular industry. Hmm. We have two minutes to go. So we do. To claim, hopefully we've demonstrated how these three technology or groups are, are powerful and how Salesforce supports them. Um, we have two minutes. One minute for Q and A. <laughs> what do you reckon, D? Can we do a quick Q and A? No questions have come through. All right, so you've got you've got ten seconds. If you're ten asking seconds. any questions, we'll, 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 nine, I'm going to wrap it up. eight, seven, six. I don't know if we have. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Let's that's wrap okay. It up. Okay, John, do you wanna do you wanna talk to me this bit? Well, thank you, thank you for bearing with us, guys. Again, sorry about the slides; it'll be fixed as part of the uh, the upload that you guys will be able to get to. Because, like I said, some amazing slides there from Chris, very deliberately to give you lots of crunchy detail on on exactly how you could start to rethink some of these flows with the power of generative AI. Good news is this is not the only part of WorksFest. Far from it. Um, if you love these glasses, you'll be able to see them again in the not so distant. Uh, also, if, if there's one session to make, we've got obviously our, our keynote you can join us in person at salesforce tower uh or you can also dial in virtually if you can't make it there thursday 6 of june 4 30 p.m you can scan the little qr code there's also a heap of links on our site you'll see some links as well uh in the posts that we'll be making throughout the week there's a number a whole whole agenda you can uh, uh find on our website you can register for whatever takes your fancy and of course we'll have huge amounts of content available uh offline as well thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, yeah, peace out. Stay frosty. DJJC, signing so out.